All right, let's all yeah. quiet down a little bit. Okay, my name is Vincent Ledvina. We're going to do some time lapse today. Hope you guys are all ready. So the title of my talk is Northern Lights in Motion, How to Capture Time Lapses of the Night Sky. And the clicker works. <laughs> no, I think I just got to click it for now, and then it'll go back. Hold on. Okay, now we're good. All right, let's get this show on the road. Okay, so outline of the talk. Um, it's going to be aimed more at beginners, but it's definitely going to go into some more advanced topics. If at any point you have a question, raise your hand and I'll try and see you and uh, point it out. But uh, I'm going to be moving a little bit fast. It's only 45 minutes. This could be a two hour talk. It could be a three hour talk, really, as long as uh, it needs to be. But it's only 45 minutes today. So I'm going to have to go a little bit fast. I'm really just going to move through sort of logically, um, starting with what is a time lapse and then moving into gear that you need um, and then sort of in the field, how do you actually do it? And then moving into post-processing, which I think most of you are here for, because that's where things get interesting. So the scope of the talk, you know, I'm not gonna be doing a demo because that would take way too long. And, you know, I don't have the time to do that. I'm not gonna really do any advanced things. I'm just gonna be giving you sort of a broad brush um, of what a time-lapse is, uh, how to create a really good Aurora time-lapse and I have a lot of advanced tutorials on my website, and I also am recording. So this talk will be available after uh, the summit as well. And by the end of this, you'll basically know how to create a professional looking Aurora time lapse. That's the goal here, is that you leave this room with an idea of what you need to get started. Not necessarily everything you need to know step by step, but you at least know what it takes. So who am I? Just a quick introduction. Uh, this is my second Aurora summit. I've been Aurora chasing since I was 16 years old. Um, the first Aurora I ever saw was in 2003. I was four years old. And uh, that was kind of what got me started, so to speak. I obviously don't remember necessarily the whole, you know, event of 2003, but I do remember seeing the Aurora and I grew up in Minnesota in the Twin Cities. So it was pretty spectacular from there. Um, I'm a PhD student at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. I'm going for uh, space physics. So I'm actually studying the Aurora or school, which is pretty awesome. And I'm doing my research on auroral beads, which I'm sure many of you have seen. Um, grew up in Maplewood in the cities, as I said. Went to UND for undergrad, so go to. Nice. so lots of audience here. Um, and yeah, since 16, I've been an aurora chaser and photographer. So I actually got into the science from aurora chasing. So that's kind of my story. So what is a time lapse? Um, really? It, there, there's a lot of definitions, but one that I saw that sort of fit for me was um, denoting the photographic technique of taking a sequence of frames at set intervals to record changes that take place solely over time. And then when the frames are shown at normal speed or in quick succession, the action seems much faster. And we're going to see if this video works. So this is um, just an example of a time lapse. I'm sure we're all familiar with this, but just to get it out of the way in case you're not you're uh, taking a bunch of photos, or it could be video too, but we're gonna be covering photo time lapses here. You're taking a bunch of photos uh, with an interval, let's say five seconds. So one photo every five seconds, obviously that's not real time, but when you speed it up, um, you get something that plays back at a normal frame rate, like 24 frames per second or 30 frames per second. And you're able to see the motion of whatever's going on uh, in the sky, in the landscape uh, accelerated. So it's basically like you're speeding up time, essentially. And so here's just some time lapses I've shot. Uh, this was last year in uh, Fort Yukon, Alaska. So I've done a lot of Aurora time lapses. My hard drives are chock full of images, <laughs> many, many terabytes. <laughs> so why would you do an Aurora time lapse, right? Um, it's kind of hard. And a lot of people tell me like, what's the point? Well, there's actually a lot of logical reasons why you should be doing Aurora time lapses. The first one is that it shows the evolution of the Aurora. That's kind of straightforward. And that's great because a lot of people don't realize that the Aurora moves. A lot of the public who you talk to about Aurora chasing say, yeah, but it's just a cloud. It just stays there, right? And you have to try and tell them, no, it actually does move, but it's hard to see the movement. And, you know, they just get confused. So if you have an Aurora time lapse, you can show them like, hey, it actually moves. Like, here's what it looked like over 10 minutes. And they can see it rippling across the sky. This is March 23rd um, in Fairbanks. I don't know, but I don't think it'll replay, but... Um, 
So it allows you to show the evolution of the aurora, which is great for people to see. It also allows you to leave your gear be and just set it and forget it. That, this is the main thing for me is that when I'm out aurora chasing, I just want to set up my gear and then enjoy the show. I think a lot of people get hung up in the photography, which is fine, but it's great to just enjoy the aurora for what it is. Even if it's your thousandth show, I think, you know, there's always surprises and you can just leave your camera up. You can set up for a time lapse and just walk away and just, you know, trust that it's going to be taking photos. And if you set up your camera right, you're good to go. You also just won't miss any part of the show since you're not fiddling with anything. You don't want to be looking down at your tripod and then, you know, look up all of a sudden and the aurora is exploding above your head and you missed it, right? That's happened with me with mid years before. It's all, I've seen the ground light up in front of me. I'm like, hey, turn off your flashlight. And there was a huge bull eye that just he streaked through and I missed it because I was fiddling with camera settings. So you don't want to be doing it. Cons? Well, it just takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of storage. It takes a lot of time for editing. You need a good computer. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's a lot of work involved, but I think the pros outweigh the cons. <laughs> So gear required, you know, it's actually not too gear intensive. I mean, gear matters for our photography, right? It's not like you can go out with your, um, you know, 20 year old DSLR and start taking great Aurora photos. I mean, the new cameras are better than the old cameras, but in terms of a time-lapse, you really don't need anything too specific. Um, it's kind of just general Aurora photography gear. So you need a camera with a manual mode. I'm gonna be going more in depth into this, but this is just a kind of a broad overview. You need a camera with manual mode, wide aperture lens, a tripod, that's obvious, intervalometer. So this is sort of the extra is the intervalometer. And then I always recommend, um, you know, up here it's cold. And especially in the fall and spring, you get a lot of dew that forms and it's really moist in the air. So you want a lens warmer or a dew heater so that you can totally, you know, explode that moisture off your camera and lens. And then also battery grip helps too, since you'll be running your camera for hours and hours. So in terms of camera, this is where people get really excited because it's gear and everyone likes talking about gear. So are there any specific cameras? Not really. I mean, anything that's modern, you know, post 2014, 2015 is going to do a good job. Um, full frame sensors are usually better, but really what matters is the size of the pixels. So I always make this analogy is if you're thinking about photography as, you know, there's light coming in from the outside and it's filling up little wells on your camera sensor, which are like your pixels. You want bigger wells that'll take in more light or more water. Um, and full frame cameras that are the same uh, resolution as an APS-C uh, camera. So APS-C is a smaller sensor size, right? Let's say it's 24 megapixels on APS-C, 24 megapixels on full frame. Those full frame pixels are gonna be bigger. Those wells are gonna be bigger. So really it doesn't matter the size of the sensors, the size of the pixels, but to be honest, anything that's new is going to work fine any 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 decent camera nowadays will be just fine so um yeah modern sensor design with large pixels this is my setup it's a lot um this a7r2 has served me well but it's on its way out the batteries just uh can't handle the cold anymore so if you have an older camera that struggles with battery life some of the newer models are really good especially the mirrorless cameras they've gotten a lot better um probably like 2018, 2019 is when they started rolling out the bigger batteries. Um, so like my Sony a7 IV and a7R IV, those are great cameras, I love them. And it also helps to have an internal intervalometer. So you can buy external intervalometers, but the internal ones are nice because you can just go in your menu, you can configure it, press go, and it'll start the time lapse. You don't have to worry about plugging something in. Uh, you don't have to worry about charging that thing too. It's another thing to charge. And the brand doesn't matter much. And this said anything really works. For lenses, this is where it gets more important. So the camera doesn't matter as much as the lens. The lens matters the most. And you want something with a large aperture, f2.8 or wider. So f number, again, it's the focal ratio. So um, lower f number is actually a wider opening. That's the weird thing in photography, right? Um, and I prefer a wide angle field of view, like 12 or 14 millimeters. But if you're down at mid-latitudes like we are here, so that works up in Alaska because the aurora is literally the entire sky. So you want as much as you can. But down here at mid-lats, um, when I was in North Dakota, I would sometimes be shooting with an 85 millimeter lens because the aurora was so close to the horizon. But uh, a 35 is sort of as, as, as narrow as I ever go uh, nowadays. But anything with the aperture larger than f2.8 will be good. Obviously bigger. It's better in this case. So if you have a f1.4, that's going to be a lot better than f2.8. 
Um, you also want to look for a lens with low aberrations. So coma and astigmatism, you've probably heard of those, but those cause point sources of light to become deformed. So instead of your stars looking like little round points, they'll look like um, angel wings or like weird comet tails. You don't want that. Um, and then focus by wire, this is never really mentioned, but um, cam camera lenses either have a manual focus where the focus ring is actually coupled to you turning the uh, focus ring. So uh, it actually focuses with your hand. It's like a mechanical uh, way of doing it. But there's also focus by wire, which is you turn the focus ring and then a little motor in the camera calculates how much it should actually focus. And this is not as good for a lot of things, but actually for low light photography, for night photography, where your focus has to be set manually, you don't want it to have removed. When you turn off your camera, even if you turn your focus ring, nothing will happen. It is totally decoupled. So I actually find that's really helpful when I'm moving locations, throwing my camera in my backpack. You know, I'm really rushed. I, I'm, I'm gonna bump things, right? So and it, it's actually really nice. When you turn off your camera, your focus is locked. You don't have to worry about it. And also high sharpness too. So, you know, sharpness, a lot of people kind of over obsess about sharpness, but in this case, sharpness does make a difference. You want your stars to be as pinpoint as possible. Tripod and ball head. Um, this is one that will just, you know, you're going to find the best one that fits you with experience. I've gone through probably 20 tripods and I finally <laughs> found the ones that I like, but um, anything that's sturdy, uh, ball head that works in the cold is really important. So, you know, those ball heads have fluid in them. And some fluid freezes when it's minus 40. So you just got to make sure that you find one that doesn't do that. And also single action ball head. That's what this one is right here. It's just one lever and you can move the whole thing. I like these as opposed to these where there's three knobs. I don't like to worry about three knobs. I just want to, you know, adjust one thing, move my camera around and then cinch it back up. So really anything that works for you uh, is what you should be using. And it just takes time to figure that out. And when you've been out in the field hundreds of times like me, you end up figuring out what works. So I like this single action ball head and I just like a sturdy tripod. I don't really care if it's heavy because I don't want it to fall over. I've had cameras fall over before. When it's windy, I've lost, I lost a couple lenses last season. My cameras are all dinged up, so you don't want that. Other accessories, um, you have a lens warmer and dew heater. I actually, I need to get one of these because my camera lenses keep freezing up, but you can also find all these on Amazon, um, all these that I'm showing here for like 20, 30 bucks, even the camera grips or the, the battery grips. You don't need to go with the OEM versions. You can find, I think, Neewer and uh, Miki or whatever those brands are. They work just fine. That's what I use, just the sort of off-brand battery grips. But uh, the lens warmer makes sure that your lens doesn't, get a bunch of frost on it at night, which always sucks when you're doing a time lapse. As you start it and it looks great, 20 shots in, it's all foggy and you can't see anything. So you want to get one of these. The only problem is that these things suck power. So you're going to want to get an external battery pack where you can probably rest on the ground and just run the cable down close to your tripod. You also maybe, depending on your camera, need to get an extra battery. So on my old Sonys, for sure. On my new Sonys, I could probably get 800 shots, maybe 700 shots out of one battery. But sometimes I like to run my cameras for hours and hours and get 2,000 shots per time lapse, which is a lot. But that means that I need two batteries in my camera. So a battery grip solves this problem. Otherwise, you can also get a dummy battery. I don't know if you've heard of this, but you can basically get these dummy batteries, which act like a battery, but they have a cable running out from the bottom. And you can plug that other end into a power source, like a USB, even an outlet. So that's kind of nice. Also, an external intervalometer. You can pick these up for 15, 20 bucks. This allows you to set your interval. So your interval is what controls how many shots you'll be taking per unit time, like per minute, for example. So if you want your camera to be taking a photo every 10 seconds, if it doesn't have that already in the camera, you'll have to get something that allows you to do that. So you can pick these up again for like 20 bucks. They're super cheap. So camera settings. So we already did here. Now we're on the settings, right? And really, here's, here's another just broad overview. I'll be diving into each setting individually. but. You want manual mode and focus. You want to underexpose a little bit. You want your shutter speed, uh, either use the 400 rule or faster, and I'll be going over what that is. Your aperture wide as possible. Your ISO, I usually put it on auto. If you have a newer camera, that works. If you have an older camera, that sometimes doesn't work. And your interval is your shutter speed plus one second. Shutter speed is really the biggest thing here. So this is the, this is the, so all these camera settings have a little bit of nuance. The shutter speed probably has the most. So really what it boils down to is the longer your shutter speed is, the more quality you'll get in your photos, right? 
All we care about is exposure, which is the amount of light hitting our sensor. That's controlled by aperture and the shutter speed. The longer we have our shutter speed, the more light we can collect. However, the longer we have our shutter speed, the more the stars start to trail and also the more the aurora starts to blur out. So if you have a really static aurora that's not moving much, maybe a 10 second shutter speed will work. But if the aurora is moving crazy, you don't want a 10 second shutter speed because the aurora is just gonna blur across the sky. You won't see any of that detail, those little crisp you know, edges that you see to your eye. You won't get any of that with a 10 second shutter speed. So this takes a little bit of fine tuning to figure out, but uh, just some things to keep in mind. And then you also never want it longer than the 400 rule. And this is sort of not a hard and fast rule, but it works for 99% of people is take 400 divided by your lens focal length in millimeters. And that's your maximum shutter speed that you can use. What that means is that if you have a 20 millimeter lens, that's 20 seconds. And why is that you don't want your shutter speed any longer than that. Otherwise you'll get this. And while you may not see that, you know, on the back of your camera, when you blow it up to a large print, people are going to start to notice, hey, your stars are not actually stars. They're like little streaks. And some people like that, right? Some people like star trails. That's a whole other genre of photography. But uh, when you're trying to just take an astro photo, you don't want to make star trails for the most part. And with my 14 millimeter lens, that's my go-to. Um, if it's like a really kind of not great aurora, just really dim, kind of diffuse, I'll usually set it for 10 or 15 seconds. But if it's really going, it'll be three to 10 seconds. So this was with the 14 millimeter lens here. This is in Churchill. So it was a really bright aurora. And this is, I think, uh, two or three second shutter speed here. And the ISO was maybe like 3,200. So not crazy, right? But the aurora was so bright, I could actually do that. So, you know, just keep it in mind that your shutter speed dictates how crisp the aurora is going to be and also how much light you get. So it's always a push pull. Your aperture, this one's easy, just maximum. Um, if your lens is not great wide open, though, maybe stop it down one or two stops. So obviously, you know, the bigger your aperture opening, the more light you'll get in. That's why you want it maxed. You want as much light into the camera as possible. And your aperture, if it's always open, the larger your aperture is, the better, right? Because that's always going to be there. Your shutter speed is going to vary, right? But uh, here's what I was talking about with these aberrations. This is what coma looks like. So your normal star would look like a, a star. And a coma, coma star looks like this weird comet tail. And you don't really want this in your extreme corners. This usually happens in the corners, by the way. So what I recommend is just test your lens, right? Shoot it wide open, maybe on a clear night, just to see what happens. Examine the corners. And it's all subjective. If there's a little bit of this, that's OK. You're never going to find a lens that's completely perfect. But it's all up to you. I mean, if you see a lot of coma in your corners, but you're like, hey, it's fine, or maybe you'll just crop out, you know, the little 5% that's not great, then it works. It's all it's all up to you, basically. So always wide open, though, um, unless your lens suffers. Is there any questions? Okay, yeah. When you go from a full frame to a camera, how many stops do you lose? So... That's that's a tough one because like the full so the question was when you go from full frame to APS-C how many stops of light do you use lose um, I think that's actually a misconception you don't lose any light so the light hitting the sensor comes from comes from the lens right so it's the same light it doesn't huh the equivalent you don't you don't lose anything I mean it's just you're just cropping the light circle you're not actually losing light right. So, I mean, if you think about the pixel pitch, like the actual size of the pixels, then, you know, if you have a 24 megapixel full frame versus a 24 megapixel APS-C, then each pixel is getting less. Um, but in terms of just full frame APS-C, it's really not that big of a difference. I mean, people over-exaggerate the fact that you need a full frame camera. It's just the pixel size. Exactly the same on either camera. Yeah. Yeah. If, if the aperture is the same, it's totally exact. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, okay. I think I might have glossed over that a little bit. So um, let me go back. That was a good one. Okay, so did I say I think I'm gonna be going over this actually. So that'll be later. But the interval I said was your uh, shutter speed plus one second. So the one second is just for your camera to write to the SD card because a lot of cameras can't keep up when you're just doing shot after shot after shot. So if you add one to two seconds, it allows your camera to actually write the file to your SD card. You don't lose shots then. Um, 
I honestly don't do much. <laughs> I'm pretty bad with my gear. So there's probably other people who can help you out. But I mean, you can put like a coat over it or like a little tarp or something. Um, most cameras nowadays, you can get like, you can get snow and water on them and it's okay. I wouldn't be too worried. I mean, obviously if it's pouring, you, you probably aren't gonna be seeing, seeing any aurora in this event. So I don't know what the point is, but. <laughs> um, Oh, sorry. The question was, what do you use to protect your gear if it's snowing or raining? Then the first question was, um, what is your interval? So, okay, yes. So when you say you max out your desktops, yep. um, you're not going through like, oh, we can't really use enough two today, or maybe you got no. max out. Yep. Yeah, it's always it's always a max. Okay, I'm going to keep going, but we can do more questions later. So I just want to make sure we're able to look through here. Okay, there we go. Yeah, so let's make sure I didn't. Okay, yeah. What was I? Yep. Okay, ISO, yep. Yeah. Okay, this is another one that takes a little bit of nuance. So I always have my camera at auto ISO, which is kind of weird. People, you know, cringe when they hear auto. But um, the pros of auto ISO is that you can have your shutter speed and your aperture fixed, right? You're in manual mode, but then your ISO can change as the aurora changes brightness, which is actually pretty cool. So a big fear in time-lapse photography is that you have an aurora that gets really bright and all of a sudden your shot's overexposed. That's the worst. You don't, once that happens, your time-lapse is pretty much garbage. So you don't want that to happen. And one thing you can do is use auto ISO. Your camera will detect that the aurora is really bright. It'll lower the, the ISO and you'll have a shot that's not uh, clipped. Your highlights aren't clipped. The only downside of that is that a lot of the older cameras, the meter inside the camera is not that good at detecting how much light there is in your scene. So that's how it actually does it, right? It, it uses its little meter, like we used to have in film photography, you'd actually hold out a meter and see how much light there was. And you could calculate your exposure using that. Cameras have that, but it's all automatic with computers. The older cameras, uh, the meters aren't that great. So it won't be able to get the ISO right. So what I recommend is just test out your camera, uh, do a time lapse with auto ISO. If you see a lot of flickering in your final video, then that means your camera is not that good uh, with the meter, which is fine. Like even even my A7 Mark IV struggles. So and that's a newer camera, in 2019 or something. So, um, but auto ISO. If your camera can do it, just leave it in auto ISO the entire time. And I usually uh, put my exposure compensation down at like minus 0.7, uh, just because that seems to help a little bit too. So the exposure compensation that won't change your shutter speed or your aperture. Uh, since you're in manual mode, but it'll change the the ISO calculation just so that your camera doesn't actually overexpose. It foils, you know, it all it's all a little bit more complicated than that, right? Like your camera has different uh, metering modes, like you might have spot metering or multi metering, but auto ISO usually works. Can you say once again what you said your exposure compensation? Yeah, like minus 0.7 uh, is usually what I have it at 0.3, 0.7. And I'll, I'll be, this is all recorded too. So um, yeah, just keep that in mind. So I'll be publishing this summer. I think I'll be giving it to, to Melissa or Dixie too, and we'll be publishing it. But um, just to reiterate, uh, ISO is not exposure. So it's just a gain. So it's not a sensitivity of your image sensor. So if you're increasing your ISO, you're not magically increasing the noise in your camera. It's basically the exact same thing as the exposure slider in Lightroom. And again, this is you know out of the scope of the talk, but there's also ISO variant and invariant cameras. We're not going to go into it, but uh, this concept of ISO is very, it, you can get really in-depth into it, but bottom line, auto ISO, try it out if your camera can do it. Otherwise, just, so if your camera doesn't do auto ISO, just set it to something, take a picture, and if it's about, you know, maybe 0.7 to a stop underexposed, that's pretty good. So you just want to make sure that you're not overexposing the aurora ever in your time lapse. And if the aurora is really quiet to start out, then that means it might get brighter, right? So you want to underexpose. If the aurora just got done being amazing and you missed it, okay, whatever, you're going to start your time lapse. Well, it's probably not going to go again, right? Because usually it comes in waves. So you might want to stick it at minus 0.3, minus 0.5. It's really fine to underexpose your shots, right? If your ISO is low, your shot looks underexposed, you can recover that pretty easily in Lightroom. So don't overexpose. That's the big thing. Once you're overexposed, the data is gone. You cannot recover that. Um, so if you don't have auto ISO or your camera can't do it, just underexpose by about a stop and you'll be fine. So your interval, somebody asked about this just a little bit ago. 
Um, set your interval to shutter speed plus one second. This just allows, you know, the extra second just allows your camera to write the file to the SD card. If you have a slower SD card or a slower camera, you might need two or three seconds. Um, I've been burned by this many times is, you know, basically I'm doing a really quick time, really quick interval, like two seconds, right? So my shots are coming off my camera like that. And my SD card is not that fast. It can only write at 80 megabytes a second. Um, so I'm filling up my camera buffer and then all of a sudden I go back and check my time lapse and the interval changes from two seconds to five seconds and then back to two and then back to five. And then my time lapse is really stuttering. You don't want that to happen. So you want to give your camera some time to write to the SD card. If you have a really fast SD card and a really new camera, you could probably set your interval to your shutter speed and, and it, it would be fine. But uh, yeah, I usually just say one second. One second is usually enough. And then also keep in mind how much playback is happening on your time lapse. So I usually say 10 seconds is the minimum. Uh, for social media, for Facebook, you know, you, you 10 seconds is a nice sort of length for a time lapse. It, it, it lets people enjoy it, right? I see a lot of time lapses that are one or two seconds since over before you can really process what's going on. So 10 seconds is usually what I recommend. And if you're playing back at 24 frames per second, which is like the cinematic standard, that's 240 shots. 30 frames per second is 300 shots. In a shorter interval, right, that'll be less time you're exposing. So a little bit more noise potentially if your aurora is pretty weak, but you'll also get to your 300 shots, your 240 shots in a lot less time. So you won't have to wait outside as long. So sometimes if I'm really impatient or I know I'm, okay, I have to, you know, go do something in three hours, I can only be out here for three hours, but I want a bunch of time lapses. So I'll just have my camera at like two or three seconds shutter speed, even though it's underexposed, I know it's going to be noisy. I just want to get the time lapse. So that's really important too, is that it's all, you know, it's all up to you again, as I, as I keep saying, but you have to keep everything in mind that there's not like a one, one interval that's going to work. Um, if you want your time lapse right away, you can set a short interval and get those shots. If you want to wait a little bit longer, you have time. You want to have some really clean images. Well, then set your shutter speed a little longer. Let's say ten seconds, and you can get your three hundred shots. It'll just take longer. I saw a question. Is this your recording? Uh, no, that's not me. No. Okay, but it's blurry and. The frame here on the camera, your, your video. Oh, that's that isn't my phone, so oh, okay. Um, yeah, I don't know, <laughs> <laughs> that's not my phone. Um, anyway, so okay, camera settings so single shot versus time lapse settings. So, what's the difference between a time lapse? Um, if it keeps going on to you, can just you can probably just exit it, exit out of the line. I don't think I don't care. Um, Single shot versus time lapse settings. What's the difference, right? Um, we all hopefully are semi familiar with how to take an Aurora photo. What are the differences between an Aurora photo uh, and an Aurora time lapse for camera settings? Well, for a single shot, you know, there's a lot less pressure to get it right the first time. You can adjust things on the fly. Uh, you can try out different settings while you're out there. Um, if the Aurora goes nuts, like you can dial back your shutter speed, dial back your ISO. You can get the shot, but for a time lapse, you have to make sure that you're good to go. You have to press the shutter button and be confident that whatever you've locked in is going to work for the next hour. So, you know, part of it too is like, you know, if you get it wrong, you just have to accept it's wrong. It's it's kind of humbling in that way, and it's kind of relaxing because once you press the shutter button, the time lapse is running. You just have to leave it be because if you stop it, then your time lapse is definitely ruined because you cut it way too short. Um, but you need to carefully select your settings, carefully select your composition too. So, you know, take some time in the beginning. That's why I always say it, is that when you get out there, make sure your settings are right to start out. Don't rush. Make sure you're okay with your composition and then leave it. You can't touch it. Once it's running, it's done. You just have to leave it go. It also requires more time outside as well. So um, if you're not somebody who likes to cold well, then maybe time lapses, you know, you'll set up your time lapse and go back in the car and wait with the heat on, which I've done a lot of times. So um, yeah, um, here's just a little time lapse here. Uh, this is from Churchill again. So um, yeah, try and get your settings right in the beginning. That always helps. If it doesn't work out, you know, editing nowadays with raw files, you can recover a little bit um, from the highlights and the shadows. Also, just a quick aside, um, what I learned recently is that when you preview your shot on your histogram, you're actually looking at a JPEG file. So if you see you're a little bit over overexposed or underexposed, you can actually recover that in post because you're looking at a JPEG file. So you know if you're if you have a really challenging scene, you can't get it all right. 
uh, with one shot, like which happens sometimes, right? The aurora is really, really bright. It looks a little overexposed, but then you're uh, shooting with the new moon, for example. Your landscape's really dark. You're seeing a little bit of clipping on either ends. That's actually okay. You just want to make sure that you're not overexposing uh, right off the get-go because the aurora might get really big like this, right? And this almost looks overexposed here. It's actually not. It's just really saturated. But, um, you know, accounting for that's important. Just thinking that the aurora might uh, get really big and bright is kind of doing a, kind of part of doing a time lapse and taking your camera settings. So in the field, I'm not going to, I have a whole talk on this later and, you know, determining when the aurora can be seen and when it's out, but finding the aurora, uh, watch for NOAA alerts and watches, check Facebook groups, webcams, uh, Aurora Source. I uh, work for them for a little bit. They're a great resource as well. They have alerts now you can sign up for uh, where they'll ping you about um, aurora chances. And then, um, you know, you also need clear skies, minimal light pollution, and the best time of the night is usually 11 p.m. to 2 a.m. So here's the fun part, post-processing. Um, so I'm going to divide this into two sort of categories. There's a basic and advanced track. So this is just kind of like the workflow for the basic, right, is you have your raw files. You have a sequence of raw files that you shot of your time lapse. So the correct camera settings, you know, you're happy with it. Uh, 300 shots, let's say. Good composition. The Aurora was going great, obviously, all the time now. Um, but yeah, so you have your raw files, then you import those in the Lightroom. You do a bulk edit on all your photos. So you'll do one photo, you'll edit it how you like it. You know, control A, command A, sync settings. Okay, great, the entire time lapse is edited. Export that, bring it into your favorite uh, video editing software, whether it's After Effects, Premiere, Final Cut, Windows Movie Maker, iMovie, whatever you want. You turn those photos into a time lapse and then you export that and there you go. Going into this a little bit more, um, what you'll do is you'll bulk edit your photos in Adobe Lightroom. So I'm not going to get into the actual demo, but um, what you do is you just edit one photo. You sort of Command A or or, or Shift A, and you uh, or Control A, and you highlight all of them, and then you sync settings. There's a button that you can sync the settings there. Um, this is really important. Is in time lapses you can get flicker by the camera settings or the uh, editing sliders that you use. So in Lightroom, there's linear editing sliders and there's non-linear editing sliders. And you would think that if you edit one photo contrast plus 20, that'll do the exact same thing across all your photos, but that's actually not how it works. Lightroom is weird. So it uses some context-based algorithm to figure out what your editing really should be. So if it's plus 20, it'll say, well, your last photo will look like this. So this photo should look like that. So these are the settings to avoid. So contrast, dehaze, clarity, and vibrance are, are really bad. Um, if you adjust those a lot, you're going to get flicker just because of the fact that they're not linear uh, editing sliders. But highlights and shadows also suffer from this, but not as much. So you can you can work with those. But instead, use exposure, the tone curve. So you know that uh, diagonal line that you have to scroll down to see. Well, if you you know adjust one side up, one side down, that's the same thing as changing contrast. It's just a different it's just a different math that's being used in the software to do it. AID noise. I use this all the time. People ask me, does it work? Like, does it cause flicker? It doesn't. Like, it doesn't cause any flicker and it works great. So AID noise in Lightroom is probably the best feature that's rolled out in the past five years. I'm sure all of you <laughs> can attest to that. You can take a pretty crappy looking shot and all of a sudden it looks great. So um, I use this all the time. My time lapse just takes just takes forever. Um, you know, if you have a thousand photos, your computer's probably going to be chugging through for like a day. So <laughs> I, I had a 4,000 shot time lapse I did over the course of Three, three full days. It took my computer a week. <laughs> so yeah, if, if you have like one of those family computers that's just kind of sitting in the corner, maybe maybe fire that up and let it run for a while. <laughs> that might be the best way to do it. Because if, if you're, you know, if it's if it's your work laptop, you can't have that out for a full week. So um, once you do that, once you have all your settings, uh, export the image sequence as uh, JPEGs or TIFF files, whatever you want. Uh, TIFF files are like JPEGs, but they're just a bit better in terms of the, the color depth. Uh, JPEGs work fine, though, for the for the most part, unless you're trying to do some like IMAX quality uh, film, then you're going to be working with HDR and things like that. But um, compile your movie with your favorite video editor. My favorite is Adobe After Effects. You can export as ProRes 422HQ. That's sort of the highest quality uh, codec. Once you go past 422, there's, there's pretty much nothing nothing else. There's, there's higher quality codecs, but you get really, really diminishing returns. 
Otherwise, H.264 works. H.265, so these are codecs. So this, this would output as a .mov file. This would output as a .mp4. Uh, H.265 uses a different encoding algorithm that's not great for low light. Uh, H.264 is a little bit better. So uh, just for example, here's a time lapse I shot. This is again March 23rd. I have a lot for March 23rd, but this is using uh, ISO auto. So my settings were 3.2 seconds, f1.4. Here's my gear. Here are my um, editing settings here in Lightroom. So this is with the basic workflow. I didn't use any fancy software, just imported. I think it was like 700, 800 shots. Just click, you know, one photo, edited it, control A, sync settings, AID noise, output as JPEGs, put it in After Effects, 44 <laughs> frames per second. I got a, you know, roughly, what is this, 20 second time lapse or something. And boom, I was good to go. It took me a couple hours. So pros of the uh, basic post-processing is that it's easy, quick turnaround time is cheap, you don't have to buy any additional software, but the cons are that you can only edit for one point in your time-lapse, and time-lapses with a brightness or color variation just won't look right. So the, here's an example of that. Uh, here is a, a blue hour uh, turning to night, and you can see that it started out really blue, almost way too blue, and then it turns out that the sky looks good here. So what I did was I edited the last photo in the sequence. So I chose the star photo, I edited that. The white balance had to be adjusted, right? So I had to uh, really crank down the white balance. But that meant that the first shot was way too blue. So sometimes you can't just sing settings across all your photos. If you have a really huge light change from sunset to night, you can't do that. Here's another example. This is going in the opposite direction now. So I edited the first photo, so it looks good. But then as it turns dark, you're gonna see that the sky is way too orange and purple, right? So if you have like a sunset to night transition, you can't you can't just edit one photo and say, okay, well, that's good for the whole thing. Because you're looking at four or five hours of light change, which is you know 10 stops in, in the real world. Your, your sky's turning from blue to this orange color, and you have, you have to do something else. That's where the advanced workflow comes in. So now we're getting now we're getting way into it. This is this is like this is the pro stuff here. So now instead of just Lightroom, we're adding this other software called LR time lapse. This is amazing. LR time lapse is one of the best inventions there are uh, <laughs> for time lapse. This thing basically can do everything. So instead of just editing one photo now, you're using LR time lapse to define keyframes. You're editing those keyframes. So let's say you have five keyframes. You're editing each of those keyframes separately. And then LR time lapse will blend the settings in between the keyframes. That's what's amazing about it is that you can have a blue hour shot, you can have a Milky Way shot, you can have a sunrise shot. Let's say those are three separate shots that you're going to edit. You know, you just pick one in blue hour, one in Milky Way, one at sunrise. LR time lapse will calculate the settings adjustments between the shots. You also have AID noise. We already talked about that. So basically the exact same, but you're adding this LR time lapse. So I'll show you how to do LR time lapse. But um, once you get into After Effects, I like to use these two plugins, Neat Video and Flickr Free. Neat Video just adds a bit more denoising. So the whole equation and then flicker free gives you a bit more control over the flicker sometimes um lr time lapse so it has a it actually has flicker removal in the software sometimes it does a pretty good job um but it needs a bit more work so flicker free can help with that <laughs> okay so just a quick overview of our time lapse i know that we're okay we're at 15 but we started late so we have some time um lr time lapse this has this is a whole i mean it's really an advanced piece of software and it requires a lot of time uh, to really get right. But basically, if we're gonna boil it down to what's important here, um, as I said before, you have keyframes. So here's what the actual software looks like. And by the way, this is free. It's free to start out. You can only do up to 400 shots though. So if you have a time-lapse that's longer than 400 shots, you're gonna need to buy the, at least a personal license. Then if you wanna do some of the more advanced um, internal exporting, which I never do, you can get the pro, which I think is like 200 bucks. But the personal, I believe, is like 100 something. It goes on sale all the time, though. So you can find it for as low as 80 bucks. So basically how it works, why it's called LR Time Lapse is that it stands for Lightroom Time Lapse. So you start out in this software here, LR Time Lapse, then you actually edit the shots in Lightroom. And then you work everything with metadata. So you'll read metadata from files in Lightroom. You'll write metadata to the files, which then LR Time Lapse can, can uh, detect. It makes adjustments, you save the metadata again, you, you read it back in the Lightroom, you can do your AID noise and export everything. So it's really, really slick. Here's what I would, here's what I have to say about uh, keyframes. This is the most important thing is choosing your keyframes. 
if you think about it, right, you're choosing points where you want to edit your photos. And then in between those points, LR time lapse is basically interpolating the settings. So let's say you have a, a plus one exposure, then a plus zero, and it's 20 shots in between. Each of those 20 shots is going to have, what is it, a, a minus 0 0.05 exposure adjustment in between. So knowing that, you're going to want to find where the aurora gets really bright all of a sudden, take the uh, shot right before it gets really bright at the maximum brightness and at the very end of its you know, little burst. And that kind of represents a point that you want to smooth out and have LR time lapse, um, you know, knock the exposure down a little bit. You don't want it to overexpose. And you don't want it to be brighter than everything else. So that's what I'm just saying here. Um, and again, this is not an LR time lapse tutorial that would take another couple hours because it's really cool. Um, I just encourage you all to download it and try it out. And there's the guy who made the software, his name's Gunther. He has amazing tutorials on YouTube. And that'll do a much better job than I could ever do. So, so in Lightroom, as I said before, with the basic, avoid the nonlinear editing sliders. Um, this is important too, is that Lightroom or LR time lapse uh, creates masks and graduated filters for you, which you can find when you uh, click the little plus button at the top right of your screen, and you can see all the masks and create your own mask. It'll have all the masks for you. You just click it, and then you make your own adjustments. That's really important because. Those masks that LR time lapse makes are the ones that it'll actually detect. So um, it's all in the guides online, though, all the LR time lapse tutorials. Um, this is also important, too, is, you know, don't go crazy when you're doing these keyframes with your, like, don't go crazy with your editing. Try and only keep it to one or two sliders. The less that LR time lapse has to do when it's calculating the, you know, in betweens, the better. So you don't want it to make any mistakes, and you can avoid mistakes by only touching one or two of the sliders. Um, AID noise, just some more uh, uh, nuance to that is I usually do plus 10 and plus 25. I, I don't do plus 80 or plus 90 because then it just looks like mud. It's just way too soft. So I try to keep it, you know, pretty minimal. And then if you want to get really fancy and do HDR, which um, if if you're just trying to post on Facebook or Instagram, don't do HDR. It's not worth it. Um, but if you're trying to do like a really professional looking movie, uh, they they just like literally within the past two weeks, Lightroom just rolled out an update where you can do all this internally. So there's this new um, image format called JXL, it's JPEG XL, and it actually records in 16 bit. Um, that's, there's no app there, just 16 bit. <laughs> and uh, there's also uh, this new uh, file called Avis as well, which does the same thing. It's just a bit bigger. So here's, oh, I thought that was going to play. That's okay. Um, so here's an example of processing with that advanced uh, time lapse method. So I use this for 90% of my time lapses. So getting the most out of After Effects, this is way more advanced than it needs to be uh, for you know a beginner. But if you really want to get into it, there's plugins you can get uh, called Neat Video and Flickr Free, which just make your time lapse look better. Um, neat video adds a bit more denoise uh, to your time lapse and does things a little bit differently than Lightroom. So Lightroom only looks at one photo. Neat video can almost do stacking in a video. So I think we're all familiar with image stacking, but you can take multiple images taken sequentially, like in a time lapse, for example. You can average out the noise and it'll be less noisy, essentially, because you're combining multiple photos. Neat video can do that in a video. So it'll look at one frame It'll take, uh, you can actually specify how many. Uh, it'll take, you know, one or two or three images surrounding that one frame in the video, and it'll sort of average things out. It's really cool. It's called a temporal filter. So I use that, and I also use Flickr Free when LRT can't do everything, uh, which if you have a really, uh, you know, really harsh change in light, let's say from sunset to night, you're going to get some Flickr just inherently. So Flickr Free is kind of nice for that. These things do cost money though. So I'll get into the cons of this, you know, advanced workflow, but also masking too. This is again, I'm not going to go into hundred percent here, but uh, you can mask out your foreground. You can add heavier noise reduction, deflickering. So if you have like a car passing through and it creates this, this light on your trees, for example, like a quick flash, you can use masking and after effects too, and then use a freeze frame. There's a freeze frame function uh, in after effects and you can totally remove that which is really nice. So in a time lapse, you tend to not want to have all these weird distracting elements like uh, headlamps just all of a sudden, you know, blinding you or cars 
running by, but that happens all the time, right? Because your camera's out for two or three hours and you're likely not alone. You're at a dark sky park or something and there's people around. So you can get rid of a lot of that with masking and uh, using the, the freeze frame function after effects. And I have a lot of this on my website too, or I'll be getting it up there soon. So, you know, the cons of, of this is that it costs money. So just before this doesn't, uh, yeah, before it ends here, this is what the advanced, this is with the sort of simple exposure or simple editing workflow. So once this stops, I'll actually go and play it again. So you can see that. There we go. So you can see here in the advanced workflow with LR time lapse, it starts out a lot brighter and the exposure doesn't change much, right? Because I put keyframes in that say, okay, well, in the beginning, the Aurora was really dim. So I might want a plus two exposure adjustment. When the Aurora is really bright, I don't need any. And then at the very end, when it's dim again, I might need a plus one. So that's why it's really bright in the beginning versus this is just editing for the brightest point in the Aurora. So when it gets really bright, I just edited that frame. I don't want an overexposed, right? So I don't want to put a plus two exposure adjustment on the very front end of this uh, time lapse and then sync the settings across the whole thing because when the Aurora is really bright, well, that plus two exposure is going to make that Aurora basically like the sun. It's going to be bright. It's going to be white. So that's the advantage of doing LR time lapse is you can create a time lapse where the Aurora is not changing brightness a whole lot. And some people don't like that. Some people like to show, yeah, the Aurora set up, started out really, really dim and then it got really bright and got really, really dim again. So we see that one more time. So in this time lapse, I mean, it is kind of cool. You can see the Aurora was really, really dim and then it got really bright, right? And then it got really dim again. Some people like that, but with LR time lapse, you can smooth everything out and it's kind of the same exposure throughout. So it takes a lot of effort, more rendering time, but again, it's what everyone uses. It's that cinema quality. So wrapping it up, um, this is sort of coming to the end now, is why do you do a time lapse? Well, I explained this in the very beginning, but it allows you to relax. You can set up your camera, you can leave it be. It allows you to capture the motion of the Aurora, which is what we all love, is seeing the Aurora dance and conveying that to other people is awesome um, because you can show them, yeah, the Aurora actually does move. It's not just this cloud. And how you do that is with careful selection of your camera settings at the very beginning when you're starting your time lapse, um, knowing what you have for gear, um, you know, your, your gear probably won't change. You probably already have the right gear, but if you need a wider aperture lens, that'll always help. If you need an intervalometer, uh, you'll have to get one. And then getting the shot, you know, um, making sure that your time-lapse settings are correct right away, uh, figuring out your interval is important, how long, you actually want to be outside taking photos, how many shots you want to end up with for your final video. Those are important things to keep in mind. And then post-processing is um, the main thing, right? Uh, that really is what takes your time lapse from just being a sequence of images and turns it into a beautiful video. So that's all I have. And I think we're wrapping up, but we can take questions too. Is it? Yeah. So when you start out with your initial uh, time lapse, um, are you just going, like, this is due north, are you just going with it to the north and northeast for your initial, or are you going to the north and northwest, or just trying to get the whole sky from northeast and northwest? Did everyone hear that? Okay, so the question was, when you're first starting your time lapse, do you go due north, or do you go a little northeast or northwest? That's actually a good question, because if it's the beginning of the night, the aurora is coming from the northeast and moving towards the northwest. So in, if you're anticipating a really big show, I tend to face my camera either um, east or west. So in the beginning of the night, I'll face it more northeast. At the end of the night, more northwest. Yes. When you're doing your day and night stuff, do you do during the day to night all the manual, or do you like start to have the priority and yeah. get the night? Okay. Yeah. So for day and night stuff, I'll do um, aperture priority auto ISO. Or it's it's aperture priority, but it's with uh, the minimum shutter speed auto ISO setting yeah. at your maximum shutter speed you want. Okay. So like, usually also that's like 10 seconds if I'm at a 14 mil lens. I use uh, a lot of plastic here and there. It, it is pretty, it's got to be pretty quick right here, but it's amazing when you figure out the mm -hmm. Um I've noticed that when you can use after fire speed, it's maybe it's, I'm not sure you're right, but it doesn't let me use deep flicker. Mm. That's weird. Yeah, I don't know. I've never had that, so might be a weird word. Any other questions? Otherwise, um, I'll be around too. Yeah, let's go ahead.
Again. Question was in case anybody uh, is still here. Uh, the question was how often do you see the aurora with your eyes and where do you go in fair? Right? That what you said. So, how often do you see with your eyes? I mean, I see it all the time with my eyes, probably 99% of the time when I'm in Fairbanks because it's really strong. And in Fairbanks, that's a, that's a you know, there's a lot of a lot of places I go, but usually just within town. So, yeah, Bones Pond, Belay Road, Nordale. I can give you more information. Yeah, think we're good. All right, thanks. Thank you. Thank you.